This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Senior Chinese and American officials meet in Switzerland. Mali summons France's ambassador as tensions between the two countries escalate. And world's first malaria vaccine gets WHO nod for Sub-Saharan Africa. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier and here with the latest in business, it's Rama. Thank you very much, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in 30 minutes. Headline inflation in Ethiopia has gone up to nearly 35% in September, driven by skyrocketing food prices. And the global aviation body IATA is forecasting that African airlines will register slightly lower losses next year due to a marginal improvement in intra-African travel. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Hannah. Thank you, Rama. Well, senior Chinese and American officials have been holding talks in Zurich, Switzerland, in a bid to reduce tensions. The Chinese delegation is led by senior diplomat Yang Jiechi. They've been meeting with U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and his team. It's the first face-to-face -face talks between China and the United States since the key summit in March last month. Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden agreed to the meeting during a phone call. Well, let's not cross over to Giles Gibson, who is in Zurich for us. Giles, good to see you. What's the latest on these talks? Well, literally just in the last 30 seconds or so, uh, the U.S. delegation taking part in these talks in Zurich has actually left the convention center uh, that was hosting it. A long line uh, of black cars drove away with uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and other U.S. officials inside. So at this stage, it appears uh, that these talks here in Zurich have now wrapped up although we haven't actually yet had confirmation from either uh, the U.S. side or the Chinese side that uh, they have finished the talks. But that is what it looks like as that convoy of black cars drove away containing uh, the U.S. delegation, multiple U.S. officials. Uh, building up to this meeting, of course, we were told by the Chinese foreign ministry that the two sides would be discussing uh, China-U.S. relations. Uh, the White House weren't much more specific than that. They simply said uh, that the two sides would be talking about how to responsibly manage competition uh, between Washington and Beijing. Of course, we know uh, just about a month ago, U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping held a telephone conversation that went on for about 90 minutes. Uh, all of this is unconfirmed at this stage, but we have had reports over the last few hours that the focus of this meeting here in Zurich was to somehow line up a virtual summit between the two leaders. So that's the latest here from Zurich in Switzerland that uh, the US delegation has literally just in the last couple of minutes left the convention center and we are now waiting uh, to hear from either from the Americans or from the Chinese about exactly what was discussed behind closed doors uh, over the last several hours. Thank you so much for that, Giles. We're sure to hear more about that meaning, as you say, from you. Giles Gibson speaking to us from Zurich, Switzerland. Well, Mali's Foreign Minister Abdoulaye Diop has summoned France's ambassador to Bamako. That's following comments made by President Emmanuel Macron questioning the legitimacy of the Malian authorities overseeing a transition to elections after two coups in just over a year. Officials in Mali say France's remarks are unfriendly, disagreeable and are likely to harm the development of friendly relations between the two countries. Mali's foreign minister has called for the two sides to take a constructive approach and prioritize countering terrorism. Tensions have been rife since France announced that it was drawing down its military presence in Operation Barkhane, which is a counter-terrorism mission in the Sahel region. 
Well, we continue with that conversation with Mamadou Tapili, who is a journalist based in Bamako. We also have our correspondent, Ross Cullen, who's joining us from Paris. Many thanks to you both for bringing the latest on this story for us. Let's begin with you, Mamadou. What more can you tell us about this latest exchange between Mali and France? And has the French ambassador met with Mali's foreign minister? Uh, well, thanks. I mean, uh, these clashes have started after the comments of the French president uh, uh, to the uh, Malian transitional authorities. So the foreign minister of uh, Mali, Mr. Job, has uh, summoned the France ambassadors uh, concerning uh, the comments of the pr French president uh, and signifying him that the signifying by signifying him the disapproval and uh, the indignations of the Malian government, uh, which uh, the Malian government to the France uh, ambassadors. And he also reiterated the availability of the Malian partners, Malians uh, to, to rebuild, to build a partners with whoever, I mean, wishes to have a good partnership with Malian by respecting the principles of uh, uh, non interferences in accordance to the uh, legitimacy and of uh, the aspirations of the Malian people. So that's uh, which they had those clash between the ambassadors of uh, uh, and the Malian foreign minister due to the comments of the president, its president of France, Emmanuel Macron, the last week. Ross, let's bring it to you. How is France reacting to Mali's actions? Well, this all started um, with the Malian Prime Minister's address at the United Nations General Assembly uh, last month. It really uh, it did frustrate France the fact that the Malian Prime Minister said that France has been abandoning uh, Mali, taking a unilateral decision to withdraw its troops. Its troops. That's uh, something that France said uh, was not happening. That was irresponsible language. Uh, France has made a calculated decision in discussion with its allies across the G5 region. So not just Mali, but also Mauritania, Niger, Burkina Faso and Chad as well to start to draw down its troops based in the region. More than 5,000 soldiers there. Operation Barkhane, as you mentioned, attack uh, fighter jets, helicopters, transports, aircraft as well with armoured personnel carriers, all the logistics uh, surrounding that kind of mission, which has been there in place since 2014. France announcing a drawdown and Mali's prime minister really going on the offensive at the United Nations General Assembly. France didn't believe that was the best place for him to make those kind of comments and, and uh, really came back at the Malian Prime Minister and said that it was frustrating the way that he had laid out that argument. That is certainly not what France is doing. France is firm that it is not abandoning the region. This is making a strategic and planned withdrawal. Mamadou, how is this situation between Mali and France likely to affect the fight against insurgents, which we know is still ongoing in Mali? Yeah, it's, uh, for, it's this withdrawal of, announced by the French government. It's really a uh, very complicated situation because a uh, French government has announced the withdrawal of its troops in the north, uh, which presence of the which uh, represents uh, French represent. I mean, French rep it's uh, represented by 5,100 soldiers on the ground in the septentrional part of the north of Mali. And today, by this withdrawal of more than a half of these troops, like 3,000 people, will be left like 2,000 people, which will be represented by uh, a force called Takuba, compared to Takuba. And this, of course, will affect a lot the area because uh, it's difficult to control all this border. And this part that we call the, uh, the, 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 the zone of the three borders, which is Mali, Burkina, and Niger, in the middle, this part, which is really occupied by the insurgents, mainly the ISIS and Al Qaeda people, while these French people are withdrawing these troops, it will be difficult for the Malian to control Malian state to control these zones. And of course, that will affect the north, and mainly even it's going to grow through up the center. So that's uh, really the main question that uh, it's rising in people's mind, and also it's the reason that conducts the Malian actual government to find other solutions, uh, which uh, we can see today is by uh, trying and get a signature, a contract between some paramilitary group of Russian groups called Wagner's groups, which is a private company, military company, which Mali is trying to get a contract to become and trying to, you know, to fill up this uh, position, which will be strategic, strategic, 
strategically abandoned by the French people. Ross, on the back of what Mamadou has said about that plan for Mali to recruit Russian mercenaries, well, that's what's being reported in the fight against militants. France had expressed concerns regarding that, bringing in those Russian uh, mercenaries into Mali. From what you're hearing, Ross, how much is the issue of Russian mercenaries in Mali weighing in on this situation? Well, Hannah, France has got a long uh, dubious history in the region as well. Uh, the colonial period um, uh, with Mali, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso, uh, Mauritania, the G5 nations and other nations as well that are uh, further down in West Africa, not in the Sahel region, uh, but still speak French, Senegal, Guinea, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and many other nations as well economically using the West African franc the Central African franc, so a long history for France in the region. It does not want to see pulling out of the region. It doesn't want to see itself being replaced by Russia. We do know that Russian mercenaries, what um, Mamadou was uh, mentioning, the Wagner private military company have been uh, operating in Syria. They've been operating in Libya. They've been operating in the Central African Republic as well linked maybe or not directly or indirectly to the Russian state. Uh, that is something that Mali ha has said perhaps they could be used, the, the Wagner uh, paramilitary group, to fill the void left by France as the troops are being withdrawn, 2,000 be being withdrawn by France. Perhaps uh, Russia could, uh, could fill the, the gap using the paramilitary uh, company uh, Wagner. So that is something that France does not want to see. It has raised its concerns. It does not want to see Russia in its own backyard as something that France has long considered Africa its domain, where it is the central leading player, particularly on the United Nations Security Council. And that is where it had the largest part of its empire. That's where the legacy of the French language remains. And I've mentioned as well other ties economically as well to, to the region. So for France to, to pull out and for Russia to, to replace France indirectly through the use of, of, of mercenaries is something that Paris couldn't countenance and something that Paris has made very strongly, openly, uh, said that it does not want to see that happen and it will be uh, continuing conversations to ensure that that does not happen. But Mali's Prime Minister is saying, uh, it, essentially, if France is pulling out, we do need some to help when it comes to the security issues, trying to disarm and dismantle these armed groups uh, operating in the region. So if France is pulling out, it might look elsewhere. Balmaco might be looking elsewhere, perhaps to the Wagner paramilitary company, uh, to fill that void. Thank you so much for that, Ross and Mamadou. Mamadou Tapili speaking to us from Bamako, and Ross Cullen is speaking to us from Paris. Thank you so much to you both. Well, meanwhile, the Takuba Task Force, as was mentioned earlier, a group of elite soldiers from across Europe have started their mission in Mali. The soldiers have been patrolling in pickup trucks and motorcycles with Malian soldiers. The group has been tasked with defeating a decade-long Islamist insurgency in the Sahel region. Nongtula Shabalala has more. Operation Takuba is underway in Mali. It was established as a partial successor to France's Operation Barkhan. That's following France's decision to scale down its 5,000-strong counter-terrorism operation in the Sahel. Elite soldiers from across Europe form part of the Takuba task force, alongside a few French soldiers. The troops have been deployed in villages in northern Mali. Many militant groups operate in this region. When we are on an operation, we also talk to the local population in the area. We try to speak to them. We try to get closer to them. That is what we do. We went to meet the village chief, but unfortunately we didn't find him because he wasn't there. We went to the market and we spoke to the people. We told them we are here to help them. We are not here to hurt them. The soldiers have been patrolling the area near the border with Niger. Islamic State-affiliated militants are suspected of killing 50 civilians here. Operation Takuba is using smaller, more mobile units with lighter equipment. The commanders say this is better suited for the conflict. Their game-changing tactics are needed in the Sahel. Violent attacks across Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso have increased eightfold since 2015. Hundreds have been killed and over one million displaced from their homes. Noctula Shabalala, CGTN.
The Southern African Development Community has decided to extend its troop deployment in Mozambique. The decision was reached during an extraordinary summit hosted in Pretoria. Zadik troops have been fighting militants in Mozambique's Cabo Delgado province. The current deployment mandate was set to expire on October the 15th. Angela Coppola has the details. The summit leaders from South Africa, Botswana, Namibia and Mozambique agreed to extend the troop deployment for at least another three months. President Musi, by inviting SADC to assist Mozambique in its hour of great need, you have afforded SADC to demonstrate its solidarity with Mozambique and the people of Mozambique, but you have also afforded SADC to demonstrate its commitment to fostering the unity and the integration of the Southern African Development Community. The summit was silent on the impact of the Rwandese troops in Cabo Delgado. This worried some analysts. There has been no collaboration on the ground between uh, SADC forces and the uh, Rwand uh, Rwandese forces uh, in Mozambique. Um, the summit will have taken advantage of this opportunity to extend a hand to uh, the run, uh, run, run these forces in Mozambique so that there should be better collaboration. But what I see so far, the fact that the summit has been completely silent about the issue, um, for me signals that uh, it is a continuation of the uh, tension existing between uh, the two forces in Mozambique. The SEDEC leaders acknowledge the progress had been made in the fight against the insurgents. There is no doubt in our minds that whilst progress has been registered in the operations of the SADC mission in Mozambique, more ground will still need to be covered. The coming few months are therefore going to be critical in shaping the future trajectory of the Southern African Development Community intervention. Analysts expect that the fight will be a long and drawn out affair despite the early victories. It's a very, very cunning enemy. It's an enemy that knows exactly what they are doing. Uh, it's an enemy that has mastered uh, guerrilla tactics, um, you know, to their advantage. So any early gains should be taken with a pinch of salt and not the, you know, uh, we cannot celebrate and forget that there's still a long way to go with this uh, war. The troop deployment in uh, Cabo Delgado is ongoing and it's going to take some time before there's any kind of resolution. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. The World Health Organization is recommending that the recently developed Moscurix vaccine be used, be widely used on African children. This comes after a piloting of immunization programs in Ghana, Kenya and Malawi. The WHO says the vaccine should be rolled out across sub-Saharan Africa and in other regions with moderate to high malaria transmission. The vaccine was developed by British drug maker GlaxoSmithKline. It's a first and to date the only vaccine that has demonstrated that it can significantly reduce chances of a person getting malaria. The long-awaited vaccine for children is reported to be a breakthrough for science. It's also reported to be a major advance against a disease that kills more than 400,000 people annually. It's time now for a short break and return more news, including... The WHO pledges reforms to address allegations of sexual abuse in the DRC. And we tell you what Egypt is doing to improve rail safety. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Tunis, Syria, Juba, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live.
find your voice. I try to not let it affect me, but there are days when it does. I'm a human being, and to see patients in a hospital bed and their family members are not there, there's no one there to hold their hand, that that human touch, you know? Welcome back. You're watching Africa Live. Well, the World Health Organization has pledged to undertake organizational reforms to address issues of sexual abuse in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A recent report by an independent commission of inquiry set up by the WHO acknowledged that more than 80 alleged cases of sexual abuse implicating at least 20 WHO staff members in the DRC. CDTN's Daniel Arab Moy has that report. The World Health Organization's weak internal justice system is reported to have exposed issues of sexual abuse in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The alleged cases of sexual exploitation against women and girls date back to the 2018 Ebola outbreak in the country. The WHO has moved in swiftly to undertake reforms to make its systems more transparent. We thank the survivors for their courage in coming forward. And um, the Director General has promised swift and immediate action to address the recommendations of the Independent Commission. And these actions will include provision of support and justice for the victims. It will include addressing uh, management and staff failures and in also a wholesome change or reform of the organization's structures and culture when it comes to prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. Investigations to establish the facts surrounding the alleged cases of sexual abuse are still ongoing. The uh, independent commission did recommend that um, further investigation be done to identify individual responsibilities for the failure to activate investigative uh, procedures. The World Health Body announced a series of new initiatives to tackle sexual harassment at all levels of WHO. This will involve the creation of an independent commission based in Goma, DRC, to prioritize investigations in at least eight countries. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Food prices in Africa have skyrocketed since the onset of COVID-19, affecting millions across the continent. And as CGTN's Nick Mudimba now reports, many people are having to adjust their lifestyles to a tough and unforgiving economic environment. The food security situation in Africa isn't getting any better and households across the continent are feeling the pinch of increased food prices. We visited Darwin Katiba, a mother of three boys who is struggling to feed a family in Nairobi, Kenya. Her purchasing power has gone down. She, like many others in Kenya, has had to adjust her budget to keep her finances stable due to the high cost of food. I had to make simple meals in the morning, like I'll make spaghetti and eggs. I will buy indoor meal and add with some stew so that I don't have to use so much in buying, you know, three breads, how? So we had to cut costs on such things. If it was more cereals, you balance. Cereal once a week, uji, and uh, the things they love. I have been shopping for a month. Now I do it every two weeks. We accompanied her to a local market to see for ourselves how much life has changed for her and her family. She opted to buy leafy green vegetables which are rich in nutrients and also quite affordable. When I have two of them, I can make a meal. This one I use for making vegetables too. 
but now because of what has happened I can only afford one. It cost up to 45 cents previously and now it's up to a dollar per cup. According to economists, climate change and COVID-19 lockdowns are just a few of the reasons why food prices have continued to go up in recent months. The policies that make it difficult for foodstuffs to move across countries, people who can produce it cheap, or people who can produce more competitively, to where people leave them. We need to eliminate that. Rising fuel prices have also worsened the situation in many African countries. Economists now warn that this wave won't be ending anytime soon. The chain is actually overstretched from producers, wholesalers, and of course retailers. It is actually a bad situation. Many of them are trying to fit in for survival. Nick Mudimba, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. A newly released report by the UN's Environment Programme has called for action to save the world's coral reefs. The report produced by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network highlights how rising temperatures have affected the world's reefs. CGTN's Daniel Arab Moy reports. Coral reefs are home to at least a quarter of the world's marine species. For millions of people, they provide food, jobs and protection from storms. But across the world, they are under threat from warming due to climate change. Environmentalists say their loss could be catastrophic. The local threats that affect coral reefs undermine their ability to resist climate change. So we also need to reduce local pressures, and that's overfishing, pollution, sedimentation, and so on. The 2020 report highlights a 14% loss in global coral reefs in the last 10 years. The cause of the 14% loss of reefs in the last 10 years is really global warming. Um, so warming temperatures uh, in the ocean cause coral bleaching and mass mortality. And really, since 2010 until, until now, there have been uh, repeated uh, coral bleaching events at regional and global scales. And as a result, we've lost that amount of reef. Fragile as they may be, their survival may only be guaranteed by bold steps taken by key decision makers. Government regulators around the world should integrate and coordinate to ensure that we maintain uh, the good condition which should facilitate formation of reefs. Destruction, human activity that directly interferes with the reefs should be curtailed. On a positive note, the report also found that many of the world's coral reefs remain resilient and can recover if conditions allow. Despite their immense value, coral reefs remain vulnerable to the increasing global threat of climate change. Experts say only a collective effort will help in securing the future of coral reefs. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Egypt is developing its rail network as it implements a national plan to reduce railroad accidents witnessed in recent years. For the first time in the country's history, Cairo has purchased an automated railroad track inspection device. The advanced piece of equipment checks the safety of railroad tracks. Aldo Ramruhi brings us more. Throughout its 187 years of service, Egypt's railroad has relied mainly on human power. Only 15% of the more than 9,500 kilometer long network uses electronic safety devices. The rest are mechanical equipment that are operated manually. We rely on inspecting the whole railroad network every three months, which is sufficient time to check for and fix defects. But we relied on inspectors who walk by the trucks and inspect them visually. They would walk for three to four kilometers daily and report if they see any issues. Lack of technology and poor maintenance for decades have led to many train accidents. Egypt has been reporting hundreds of train-related accidents every year for the past 20 years. But that is about to change significantly after the nation purchased its first automated railroad track inspection machine, which uses laser scanners and ultrasound to check tracks for defects. There is a huge difference between our new inspection machine and the old one we had. Our new device performs a non-contact scanning and diagnosis. The old machine was purely mechanical. Trolleys get manually installed over the track by human labor. They are connected with cables to a printer that has moving hands which draw graphs. The new contactless inspection device will make track inspections much faster. 
Officials say it could take as little as one month to cover all of Egypt's railroad network. Imported from Austria, the machine can measure with high accuracy the distances between the rails, elevation differences between them, and can also examine track conditions. Teams of Egyptian engineers and technicians traveled to Austria to get trained on using the machine. After two weeks of training there, they came back to share their knowledge with the railroad authority. We held intensive training here for two months. Our employees learned proper data analytic techniques. Foreign experts are still here to supervise our operations until we master the use of this technology. When a defect is detected, the data analytics report categorizes the urgency of intervention. It then sprays the location with paint so that the maintenance team can quickly identify their working space. This machine is expected to greatly enhance railroad safety. There are about 900 train trips made every day across Egypt. 500 million passengers commute by trains annually. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Well, in our continuing Belt and Road Initiative series, African Voices, we focus on the Ethiopia Djibouti railway line. The project that was completed with the support of the People's Republic of China has contributed significantly to passenger and cargo transport between the neighbors and beyond. And as CGTN's Giram Chala reports from Addis Ababa, the railway project is a game changer in the region. Thousands of containers transported from the port of Djibouti to this uh, dry port located just a few kilometers outside of Addis Ababa. Ethiopia's requirements from heavy machinery to everyday goods shipped here. Thanks to the Ethiopia Djibouti Modern Railway, a process that lasted days and cost down arm and a leg has been reduced to hours, saved on cost and enhanced safety and efficiency. Ethiopia's history as a landlocked nation has changed once and for all. Since the independence of Eritrea from Ethiopia, uh, we just happen to be landlocked country. And uh, this railway especially connects the Djibouti port, which is almost equal in distance to the Asa port. So for us, uh, you know, changing this landlockedness into landlinkedness by railway, professionally, in a railway industry terms, we call it land linkedness. So after having this railway, uh, for us uh, in the, the industry, we feel that Ethiopia is no more a landlocked country. There are a lot of uh, containers uh, stored at Djibouti port. So this railway is helping by facilitating the transportation of uh, these stored containers uh, from Djibouti port to the city centers, to Mojo, and also to Ndode, uh, our fight station near to Addis Ababa. Commissioned about six years back with a funding and expertise from China, the 700 kilometers rail truck transports passengers and goods every day from the heart of Ethiopia to Djibouti and vice versa. Uh, other than containers, we also transport uh, very critical commodities like fertilizer, uh, uh, wheat, um, and also uh, steel. China's import and export bank injected billions of US dollars into this mega project. Ethiopians have held China for the fact that they, alongside Djiboutians, have reaped big from uh, this key Belt and Road Initiative flagship project. The, the Chinese financing came not only with infrastructure building, but uh, they are you know, committed to operate uh, this you know, railway for the initial phase, because this railway is a standard gauge, and it is electrically and uh, you know, environment friendly, very using very intensive technology. It needs some kind of learning period from the Chinese counterparts. Beyond this railway, China has proven its commitment to Ethiopia on many other fronts. Aggressive investment in the road, industrial development, and health sectors, to mention just a few. The Chinese are real friends of 
uh, Ethiopians uh, and of course to Africa the Chinese uh, the, their contribution you know cannot be like explained uh, we are a true friend of the this uh, Chinese people and uh, the Chinese government is doing a very much encouraging work to to help the country Ethiopia is eager to see more projects associated with the Belt and Road Initiative as they march together into a prosperous future with shared goals. The story is now becoming similar for the rest of Africa too, when it comes to China's unwavering partnership with respective African nations. From neighboring Kenya to Nigeria and Senegal, the hallmark of people-centered Chinese investment is seen everywhere. Many say an infuriate President Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative launched in 2013 will transform the world like never been seen before. Group Tara CUTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Well, I'll be standing by to bring you more on Africa Live, including the latest in sport. But for now, let's take a look at what's happening in the world of business with Rama. Thank you very much, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in business news. Headline inflation in Ethiopia is nearly a 35% in September, driven there by a rise in the price of food. And the global aviation body IATA is forecasting that African airlines will see marginally lower losses next year due to an improvement in continental travel. taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting, it's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Let's start in Ethiopia. The Central Statistical Agency says headline inflation rose to 34.8% in September, up from 30.4% in the month of August. The state-run agency says food inflation hit a record high, 42%. In September, that steady increase in inflation in Ethiopia is happening despite authorities' efforts to impose a temporary price cap on food items and a three-month ban on rent increases by landlords. The country's president says that the government will focus on addressing the escalating cost of living, which has seen the price of some essential food items increase drastically in recent months. African airlines are forecast to see a slight improvement in their financial performance next year. Now, this comes as countries continue to vaccinate bigger parts of the populations and they gradually lift pandemic restrictions as well. The International Air Transport Association is expecting that African carriers will move from a projected full year loss of $1.9 billion this year to a $1.5 billion loss in 2022. Now, the airline body is attributing this slow recovery to low vaccination rates across the continent. It says the projected improvement is hinged on the expectation of some recovery in intra-African travel and travel to some tourist destinations with relatively higher vaccination rates. On to the business of energy now. Egypt and Saudi Arabia have signed about $1.8 billion worth of contracts designed to link their respective power grids. Now, the project will have a peak transmission capacity of about 3 megawatts. It will be implemented by three consortia made up of international and regional firms, according to a statement from Egypt's cabinet. Under the terms of this agreement, two transmission plants will be set up in Saudi Arabia and one other in Egypt. The East Medina and Tubok plants in Saudi Arabia will be connected to the Badr plant east of Cairo by a 1,350-kilometer-long network of cables and a 22-kilometer undersea network that will join both countries through the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, the completion of the project's first phase is scheduled for 2024. 
Over in East Africa, the mobile service provider MTN will be floating 20% of its Ugandan subsidiary on the East African nation's securities exchange. This will potentially be the largest IPO on the Ugandan bulls. Here's the GTN's Michael Baleke with the details. The initial public offering is expected to raise about $1.3 billion. MTN says the offer and listing of the mobile telecom company is in line with MTN Group's localization strategy to drive local ownership in the markets within which the company operates. We want every individual, every customer to be part and parcel of what we are going to be doing, which is we want them to own a piece of this company. The mobile telecom operator is present in 21 markets, but MTN Uganda will become the fourth operating market to be publicly listed. Uganda's Capital Markets Authority says the IPO is expected to double the amount of money the capital markets has raised since it was established in 1998, a move expected to grow the economy and create more jobs. More Ugandans will be able to open and use bank accounts. More Ugandans will be able to open and use mobile money accounts to use insurance products and to save for investment and retirement. The decision by MTN to list is also in line with the policy objectives of the government of Uganda, which require all telecom companies with a national operator's license to list at least 20% of their shares. This follows complaints by the Ugandan president that foreign-owned telecoms are draining the country's scarce foreign exchange reserves through repatriating their profits abroad. The Ugandan leader believes listing on the stock exchange will keep some of the money in the economy. The Uganda Securities Exchange says the MTN initial public offering will be delivered primarily through a digital paperless platform launched recently. Technology has a big impact on the potential of the markets and also ease of access to, to the markets by uh, uh, letting everybody at any corner of the country to be able to open an account seamlessly. MTN Uganda has more than 15 million subscribers and also offers mobile money financial services. Michael Balekesi GTN, Kampala, Uganda. On to Southern Africa. Zimbabwe's plan to develop a knowledge-based economy has gotten a major boost following the implementation of the third phase of the National Mobile Broadband Project. As the GTN's Farai Mokutuya now reports, this Chinese-funded project aims to improve the country's ICT infrastructure. Chinese ICT giant Huawei is partnering Zimbabwe state-run mobile network operator NetOne to install 345 new base stations, improve 4G LTE coverage and introduce 5G technology to a nation that sees information communication technology as crucial. This strategic project gives impetus to the digitally enabled industrialization and the growth of our economy. The project will undoubtedly help improve economic efficiencies, production and productivity across our economic sectors. A 71 million US dollar facility from China's Exim Bank is funding the expansion. The availability of the latest information communication technology is a catalyst not just for economic growth, but also the attainment of key social development goals. Upon completion, NetOne's coverage will increase to 85% of the country, including some previously unserviced remote areas. The data actually suggests that there's a massive uh, business opportunity even in uh, rural communities because um, as we are all aware of the majority of uh, internet uh, users in Zimbabwe access it through their mobile phones and this is inclusive of uh, uh, rural communities where we also have a, an increasingly young population, there's a young demographic that has uh, a huge appetite for all forms of uh, uh, multimedia which are accessed through the internet. Accessing information that relates to agriculture which is a huge component of the Zimbabwean uh, rural space as well as uh, education which has emerged as a huge driver of internet usage over the past year and a half because of what happened with COVID-19. 
According to the industry regulator, Zimbabwe experienced a 29.9% increase in mobile internet and data traffic during the first quarter of 2021, with over 90% of users accessing the internet via their mobile phones. The figures are expected to grow as e-learning and working from home become more popular, which makes the now underway network upgrade a key priority. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Mining companies in South Africa are racing to invest in their own power generation capacity due to the persistent unreliability of the country's national utility, ESCOM. They plan to spend up to $2.7 billion to develop some 2 gigawatts of renewable generation capacity in order to supplement what they do get from the national grid. Here's Angela Coppola with the details. The mining sector supported renewables and the development of green hydrogen as a fuel for this energy-intensive industry. But what impact will these investments have on listed mining stocks? Even if they were to go for 100, let's just say hypothetically, they were to go 100% um, self-reliant in terms of power capabilities, but, uh, but commodity prices fell uh, through the floor. Unfortunately, the investment community would be focused on commodity prices. So I do think that end of the day, commodity prices are the, the real driver um, of long-term uh, market caps or share prices, but that's not to take away from the importance of this. This is obviously still very important. Power is a key component in the mining sector and it's one of the biggest operating costs. And we consume in excess of 700 megawatts on a daily basis, which equates to over 7 billion rand or about 3% of national sales. ESCOM's uh, supply to us is predominantly coal based, and as a result of that, we have an extensive. Uh, carbon footprint. Other mining houses are also concerned about consistent power supply in the future. We're worried about tomorrow's risk and specifically mid-decade. Uh, we think uh, that we, you know, the country does have a looming uh, supply risk problem, uh, you know, somewhere around 24, 2024, 2025. And we, we're actually becoming quite concerned about it more so than we have been historically um, in terms of ESCOM's ability to meet demand. Some mines like Northern Platinum had decided to generate a portion of their own power before government changed the maximum generation capacity from 10 to 100 megawatts. The furthest progressed is our 50 megawatt project uh, southwest of Johannesburg. And uh, that project uh, has an identified that's, uh, site that's fully permitted. And we're hoping to reach financial close mid next year and then co begin construction straight thereafter. That plant should come into commercial operation at the end of 2023. Mining houses take a holistic view about power supply. It's not just about reducing our carbon footprint. It is actually trying to reduce somewhat our reliance on ESCOM in totality. Uh, but we are, we are very conscious of the fact uh, that we can't replace ESCOM. We can only supplement. The mining sector is one of the biggest energy users in the country and with its move to self-generation, it's going to free ESCOM up to look after the rest of the country. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. On our story for you in the segment, uh, oil prices did soar to a multi-year high, barely 24 hours ago, of $83 a barrel. That price hike was supported by the refusal by the oil production cartel OPEC and its allies to ramp up production at a much faster rate against a backdrop of concerns about tight global energy supplies. Today, though, oil prices had fallen about 1.8% to just over $81 a barrel by 1,600 GMT. That came in the wake of a report from the American Petroleum Institute showing rising crude inventories in the country. Some analysts say the technical indicators suggest that oil prices have rallied a bit too quickly. Brent crude prices have gone up by over 55% so far in the year. Natural gas prices have also risen to record levels in Europe and exporters, well, most of them anyway, have increased prices for thermal coal. And I'll leave you there for the time being, but we'll be back at the top of the hour. In Global Business, we'll be exploring plans by Google to be investing about $200 million a year in Africa over the next five years. Since 2018, the company has been building an undersea cable from Portugal with stops in Lagos and Cape Town. But here's the thing. There's no lack of investment in the data infrastructure space in Africa. Other firms could feasibly do this. So what exactly is in it for the American tech giant? We'll explore that and plenty more at 1800 GMT. For now, back to Hannah.
Thanks, Rama. We're looking forward to that. We'll see you then. Well, let's not take a show break and return your sport news, including... 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifiers return with African champions Algeria hosting Niger in Blida. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene. Find your game. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, we kick off with the 2020 FIFA World Cup qualification with the race to make the Qatar finals resuming later this evening across Africa. After the draw with Burkina Faso in Marrakesh last month, African champions Algeria are fully aware they cannot afford to waste more points if they want to qualify for the final and decisive stage of Africa's qualification. The Desert Foxes, who are unbeaten in their last 14 games, will restart their campaign at home against Niger in Group A on Friday. Rami Ben Sebani, Jamel Belrami and Islam Slimani have all been called up by head coach Jamel Belmadi, despite returning from injury and lacking in form. Of their previous five matches against Niger, Algeria have won four and lost one. There's no player who's okay when he's injured, especially mentally, when the injuries come one after the other. But the coach was there. He was sending me messages every day telling me to come back and not to get injured again. In Group E, the top two Mali and Kenya clash on Thursday in the neutral venue of Morocco. Kenya's Harambe stars head coach Engine Firat says his charges are going for the upset against her fancied opponents, Kenya, who are already in Morocco and are seeking their first victory after successive draws against East African rivals Uganda and Rwanda in their opening World Cup qualifiers. Mali topped Group E on four points after beating Rwanda and drawing against Uganda. The Turkish national Firat, who will handle his first game in charge of stars, is recalled midfielder Ismail Gonzalez and defender Abud Omar last featured for the team at the 2019 Afghan finals to his squad. Kenya will host Mali in Nairobi on Sunday in the return fixture of their double header. Well, over to Europe, where Germany are to bid to extend a three-game winning run under new coach Hansi Flick against Romania and North Macedonia in the UEFA 2022 World Cup qualifiers to show they are on the way back to being world-class. The 2014 World Cup winners are in the driving seat in Group J on 15 points from six games, with Armenia second on 11 and Romania third with 10. Hansi Flick already looked at the table in September and saw that we were in third place. But he substantiated that we have very different aspirations. As we said some time ago, we want to return to being world class. And for that to happen, every result counts. And we have to have continuity. That for me is the most important thing. To continue this positive trend that started in September. The 2017 World Athletics Cross Country Championship was Uganda's first and only major athletics international sporting event. The event introduced the world to some of the country's best athletes like Joshua Cheptegei and Jacob Kiplomo. But beyond the success on the athletics track, what kind of legacy did hosting the event bring to Uganda? CDTN's Leon Senyangi reports. Uganda has a mixed history of hosting sports competitions. But not many have come bigger than the Kampala 2017 World Cross Country Championships. Over 500 international athletes converged on the Ugandan capital. Speaking during the pre-rest conference at the time, World Athletics President Sebastian Ko hailed the event as a game changer for the East African nation. This is a big moment. It's a big moment for Uganda because this is the first time Uganda has hosted uh, a World Athletics Series event. Uh, this is a big moment for Africa. A big moment indeed. The camaraderie was immeasurable. The competition 
in Mainz. Hosting the event, many believed, would uplift Uganda's reputation for occasionally staging sporting spectacles. More than four years later, the city of Kampala has moved on. There is very little evidence that it once hosted the event. This building hosted the championship's secretariat. The signage, one of the very few reminders that the World Cross Country Championships was held here. The government invested over $1.7 million to host the event. According to the World Athletics Post event report, Uganda earned $3.6 million, both in terms of tourism and physical activity. There was no lasting infrastructure impact. If the infrastructure wasn't improved after what everyone saw Uganda do at the World Cross Country in 2017, then there we missed a step. Um, I think if we had put in more effort, try to move for a facility, let it be, all, even if it's a, a tartan, just a tartan of 100 meters somewhere, even if it's not 400 meters, I believe the impact is huge. But certainly that wasn't done. Uganda took third place overall in the medal standings behind Ethiopia and in virtual winners Kenya. That put a kick into what has since been a spell of successes. Since the 2017 showpiece, Ugandan athletes have won at least 13 individual medals at Global Athletics Championships. Most of the people who have won these medals were actually um, part of either the teams or an integral part of preparing the athletes who took part in Kololo. So I think that has gone on to inspire quite a number of athletes in one way or another. One of them is Joshua Chetegei. The 2017 event was one of his lowest career moments. He led the 10-kilometer race only to collapse on the final stretch. He finished 30th. But since then, he has risen to become a world and Olympic champion. Cheptegei says more work needs to be put in to harness the country's potential. Over the last years, I have dedicated my earnings from the track towards the construction of a training center that is due to international standards and can act as a vehicle for the young athletics talent in Uganda and beyond to achieve their dreams, like mine, of winning the gold. The 2017 sporting event remains Uganda's watershed moment. Heroes were born and a generation of athletes were inspired to aim for greatness. Leon Senyange, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember that you can send your feedback to contacts on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. From Ihan Vivia and the rest of the team, thank you so much for watching. Rama's up next with Global Business.